Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This particular series is entitled Christ and His Law, and it's a series of lessons for the second set of three months, that's April, May, and June of 2014. This is lesson four in that series entitled Christ and the Sermon on the Mount. So, of course, you've all heard many sermons on Sermon on the Mount. You all know it by memory. So this is going to be all familiar territory, right? Well, we'll see how familiar the territory is. This is the lesson for April 26, as we mentioned. If you're interested in getting the handout materials that we use in our program here, you're welcome to tune in and look down at our, our website uh, at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G and uh, you will find our materials there. You can download them if you, if you like. To, before we begin, we hope that you have your Bible handy for you, handy by you, and that uh, we're, you're ready for us to begin. Let's have a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it is with anticipation every time that we open your word to discover what you are here trying to teach us. Forgive us where we may have fallen short of your ideal for us, and help us to prepare ourselves for your soon return is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount is an interesting piece of Scripture. Matthew 5 to 7. You can read it in a few minutes. It's put together as if it was a single sermon um, pre presented on one day, and it may have been. Some scholars feel that this may have been actually several sermons that were put together. We're going to discuss the third section in that sermon, if you want to call it a single sermon. Um, the first section, of course, is the Beatitudes. The next section talks about the salt and the light. And then Jesus starts in talking about comparing the, ancient, the old laws with the new laws that, he, that he's proposing. And that's the section we'll be talking about today. Um, I think we need to get a little bit, some, some extra information on the background here to really appreciate what was going on. There was a huge crowd of people that came out um, on such occasions. Many, many people. What do we know about those people? Anybody? They're a mixture of locals and people to the north, people to the south, people to the east from all over. Specifically, we know there are a lot of people from locally in Galilee. There are people up from Judea. There were people from Jerusalem itself, probably spies from Jerusalem itself. There were people from across the Jordan in, in, in the country of Perea, and then farther north in the country in the area known as Decapolis, and then some even further north from Syria, and there were people from Tyre and Sidon over toward the coast. So there were uh, this was a huge mixture, not only of Jews, but Gentiles that were crowding in. And why do you suppose all those people were there? He was healing people, correct? He was healing people. If you couldn't, I mean, and, and what, other, what other kind of health services were available? Not much. Virtually none. So, I mean, if you've got some serious disease and you hear there's someone over here that, that can heal the disease just by touching you, I mean, what do you do? Yeah. You head there. As fast as you can go, right? So and he was teaching very interesting yeah, they, stuff. They were very interested also what he had to say. Yeah. So how did they how did they run all those people through to get healed? If there's gotta be so many people there, lots of them were sick or whatever. Mm -hmm. So did they just set him up somewhere and just have his assembly line going by? He's supposed to be he's supposed to be <laughs> preaching while yeah, all this is well, going on. Yeah, when does he have time to do that? Well, I mean, obviously people were crowding in. I think probably the disciples, he told the disciples, stay close to me, don't let people crowd you out. So they probably formed a kind of a bit of a wall around him. They probably only let people in a few at a time. He probably talked for a little while and then he would stop and do some healing and talk then for a while and stop and do some healing, would be my guess. And how would they hear? They didn't have PA systems back then. So is everybody just bone quiet? Probably. 
and thousands of people well, would not even moving, sneezing. I don't know, but even in breathing. more <laughs> even more modern times, we there's a documented time when Ellen White spoke to five thousand people without a microphone. I think God had something to do with that. I mean, how else can you explain that? It, it also says here, at least in furs, I think both that people were trying just to touch Christ's clothing. Yep. Word had gotten around, you touch him, you will. Now, it's interesting that if you compare Matthew and Luke, Matthew says this is the Sermon on the Mount, and Luke says it's the Sermon on the Plain. Well, if you look up the word plain here, it's more like refers to a level place. Ellen White simply puts it together. She says, Jesus climbed up away, because he was climbing away from the seashore, and he went up the valley a little ways. In fact, they will tell you, I was there last summer, they will say, oh, this is the place right here. I don't know if that's really the place, but there is a place you can climb up into sort of a natural amphitheater and then find a level place there. And presumably he sat down the level place and they would gather around and they could hear him and, and, and stand in line, I guess, to get healed. Um, so we've talked about the sections there, of course, is the, the final section that we didn't mention is found in Matthew 6 through the end of 7, uh, actually through 723, which are things just referred to sometimes as, as rules for Christian behavior. And then, of course, there's the final uh, parable at the end that talks about building your, rock, building your house on the rock or building it on the sand. So starting out in our section for today, Matthew 5, 17 to 20. And the first question, of course, is, and let's just read that. It'll just take a moment. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with, not until the end of all things. So then, whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, Whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. Now, you have to believe that there were scribes and Pharisees standing there. And how did they regard themselves? There was nothing higher. Yeah. Near perfect. They thought they were near perfect. They kept every detail of the law, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how do you think they felt when Jesus said these words? Angry. Probably angry. Threatened. Mm -hmm. Threatened. That's a good word. Well, first question we have to ask is, what was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about the Ten Commandments when he said the law? Was he talking about the five books of Moses that they referred to as the Torah? Or was he talking about the entire Old Testament? He said the law of Moses, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And the prophets of and the, the Old prophets. Testament. So yeah. what is the law of Moses and the prophets? Okay, the law and the prophets is a standard nomenclature for all of the Old Testament. So very likely he was referring to the entire Old Testament. But I, I will have to tell you that scholars have looked at this and there's pretty good evidence that he could have been referring to either to any one of those three things. So we're going to take the broadest approach and say he was talking about the entire Old Testament. Now, we're going to see he talks about specifically some of the Ten Commandments in, in a moment. The next thing I think we need to recognize as we, as we think about what was going on here is something that's presented in, Matt, in John 5, 39, for example. Jesus is talking here to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in, in, in the uh, Sanhedrin. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. These very scriptures. And look at another place. What about Luke 24, 44? And what were the scriptures in Christ's day? Well, that would be the Old Testament. Just the which Old Testament. Which is the law. The, which is the law, yeah. So he was talk, when he talks about the law, he's talking about himself. Well... Hold on, that's what we're trying to determine here. Then he said to them, and on another, now here he is, clear at the end of his life, it's after his resurrection, he's talking to the disciples in the upper room. Then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, 
and the Psalms had to come true. So now if you say law, prophets, and Psalms, how much does that include? There's no question about the fact that that includes the entire Old Testament, right? Yeah. So, and he says the Old Testament is about who? Himself. Him. About himself. Jesus. And then, of course, one more, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud, all passed slavery through the Red Sea. It's pretty obvious what he's talking about here, right? In the clouds and in the sea, in the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ, Christ Himself. So when Jesus talk, when we talk about the Old Testament, we're really talking about Jesus, Jesus and what He did. So are you saying the Shekinah glory that was over? the uh, Jews that were in exile or they were going across to the promised land, that was Jesus mm -hmm. hoovering over them as light by day and, oh no, light by night and... Clouded, cloud. shaded by, shade by shade day. Shade by day. Yep. And then he also provided water and yes. the, the, the manna that they ate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was the one. Exactly. And he's the one who, who spoke from Mount Sinai? That was Jesus. So when he's comparing now the commandments that he gave on Mount Sinai with what his new rules are, he's talking about two different times when he said what might appear to be quite different things. Both of these were from him. He's not talking about somebody else's laws. These both are from him. So what does that tell us? Was he clarifying the Ten Commandments when he was talking uh, in the New Testament then? Was he clarifying? He was expanding them, yes. He says it's not just what you do, it's what you think. Mm -hmm. uh, among other things, yeah. Exactly. So what specifically do you think Jesus had in mind when he said in Matthew five seventeen, I have not come to do away with them, that is the laws of Moses and the teachings of the prophets, but to make their teachings come true or to fulfill them, some versions say. What does that mean? It could mean a couple things. Yeah? Could mean could be talking about us or it could be talking about Jesus. Yeah. Okay, the word fulfill, first of all, comes from the Greek word plero, which means literally to fill up. If you pour a cup, you fill it up to the brim, that's plero. Okay? So in that context, what would it mean? To fulfill, that means to it make it come to pass. It was a fulfillment. Yeah. That means if something was, if a cup was put out there and says this is going to be filled, filled up, yeah. that's the time when it got filled up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could it be the law he was, each law he was comparing to a cup and how the people were keeping it was only filling a little bit of the cup? Well, I don't think it's saying that. I think well, it's I hadn't saying, even finished yet. Uh, I was yeah. only here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, then, and then Jesus came to show how the law really should be kept, and that would fill the cup of that law. Okay, you can go. <laughs> okay, so um, when you say a little bit. We were, we were like perverting the law. We weren't really filling it to its full but potential. But if it's perverted, how do you get this much even? Well, when you distill it, that's all the goodness you had left in the law you were keeping. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, at least it seems clear that Jesus' intention was to spell out the laws the way he wanted them to be kept, right? Now, that raises another question. I thought God never changed. Remember what it says in Matthew 3, verse 6? I am the Lord and I do not change. So, how come he's giving a, what appear to be different, expanded definitions of these laws now that he's here as a person than what he gave before in the old days? Because we're only, when you say that, you're only looking at God. I think we've changed. Okay, very good. So, in other words, basically what we're saying is God didn't change, but he has to deal with us where we are in our situation. Mm -hmm. And so, we, what we're saying is that the, a bunch of illiterate slaves who came out of the 
slavery in Egypt, and they're out there in the desert, they've just barely sort of even realized who they are. You speak differently to them than you do to a group of people who've had education, a fair amount of education, been exposed to the scriptures every Sabbath for a long, most all their lives, etc. They're different people. Well, they're different people, so with God different reacts understandings, is, reacts yeah. to them a different way. Mm -hmm. And then when they see God reacting a different way, they can accuse him of changing. But he didn't. No, he didn't. Well, is it like when you put an object somewhere and someone looks at it and says, I see this and this and this. And another person's over here says, oh, I see this and this. And another person's over here say, I see this and this. The object is not changing, but the people's view is changing. So yeah. the people just getting out of Egypt would have had this view, and here we are in the space age, and we're having this view, and saying, wow, God changed. Well, the classic example of that is something that I'm all, sure you all must have heard it sometime. There were six blind men who were brought to see an elephant. And one got a hold of the trunk. He said, oh, an elephant is like a rope. And one got a hold of the leg of the elephant, and he said, oh, this is this 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 feels like a like a tree, and the other one was the side of the elf. This feels like a building, and you know. And, and the other one got a hold of the tail, I think, and I don't remember the other. You know, he thought this is like a piece of string or something, you know. And each one, obviously, they had to, you know, they were where they couldn't see, and they're just feeling what they could feel. Yeah. Now, us in the space age should be able to go all the way back and see the whole spectrum and come up with the right answer. Well, a more complete answer anyway. Mm -hmm. And surely we as Seventh-day Adventists, with our additional light that we have been given to our prophetess, um, should have even more privilege than, than they did. Um, and it's interesting, in light of that, talking about old and new, uh, look, at, look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. I will not be like the old, it will not be like the covenant which, that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So that would be something he did maybe at Sinai. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So if God doesn't change, why is he talking about a new covenant? A new covenant? Mm -hmm. You know, I've read all through the Old Testament. I've been trying to find where this old covenant was different than the one that Jesus was talking about, and I can't really find it. I'm going I'm to help you right now. Go to Exodus 19, verse 8. What is a covenant? The promise. A promise. It's, it's an, promise. an agreement. Contract. It's agree, a contract and agreement. Okay, Exodus 19, 8. There's three places here where the old where it talks about it. Uh, and I, we should really start with verse 7. God says a bunch of things to Moses, and then verse 7 says, so Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. So Moses is just reporting now. He hasn't even gone up. The commandments haven't been given yet. None of that. Okay. He reports to the elders. The elders go back and tell the people. And what is their response? Then all, verse 8, Then all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. So God says, I, I don't, I don't think you understood everything I had to say. So he gives them the Ten Commandments, and then he gives them a bunch more rules and so forth. And then about uh, four chapters later, in chapter 24, look at what happens. Get there in a moment. You can get kind of dizzy watching that screen. <laughs> okay. Look at Exodus 24, starting with verse... So now what happens? Moses comes down after giving the, getting the Ten Commandments and all that, and he reads them to them. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances, and all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. 
And Moses wrote them all down. So now he writes them down again, and then he reads them again. And verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant in which the Lord's commands were written and read it aloud to the people. They said, We will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. And how long did that last? Not long. Was this before they did the golden calf and danced? Just yeah, before just, they did yeah. the golden calf. So here's the old covenant. What's different between that and the one I read you from Jeremiah 31? Who's doing all the promising here? The people. And who does all the promising in Exodus 31? Uh, Jesus. Hmm? Do you remember? God. God does all the promises. You go back to Exodus 6, 6 and yeah. following. He says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. Yeah. I'll take you out of the land of Egypt and, and take you to the land I promised your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then it goes on further, it says, but the people didn't listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just... Mm -hmm. it, well, it's, it's strange that the, the idea of the law and everything in it didn't really hit the people as something that's difficult for them to do. You know, but Jesus kind of did a little better because he says, if you're not any better than the, the uh, Pharisees, uh, you know, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. So at least he's telling them that, that okay, this whole thing is going to be really difficult. You think, you think the people turned around and looked at the scribes and Pharisees with their mouths hanging open? <laughs> but but, but, how do you but think Moses the didn't do that. that. <laughs> Moses didn't do it. He just read it. Yeah. And I don't think they understood it, but I think, what they were so, promising. I'm sorry. So, you know, but I think Jesus went, took it even further. It wasn't just about behavior. You just do things or you start acting. They had to become, they had to change, you know, really change, be somebody different, not just do steps. And I, I think that was the main thing with Jesus. And I think it still is that. Well, a lot of people think that. They, do, they just have to do things do differently. Things. I'm different now because I do More. things differently. Yeah. <laughs> Is it in our DNA and our humanness that we couldn't keep a New Year's resolution if our life <laughs> depended on it? Probably. <laughs> and God is saying the new covenant is I will keep the New Year's resolution. I will write all these heart. things into your heart. Uh, write it into your heart so that you will want to keep it and you will actually be keep it. Mm-hmm. So without God writing in our hearts, we are doomed. Yeah. God can't for even force that. You have to m make a choice. Yeah. I mean, it, you invite him. Yeah. You invite him to do it. Well, let's take some specific examples. Matthew 5, 21 and 26. <clears throat> you have heard that people who are, were told in the past do not commit murder. Anyone does will be brought to trial. Now, where is that found? Um, Refresh us. Well, if, you, if you're going to put it very briefly, it, it says, do not kill. Oh, Thou shalt not kill. Okay. This is, yeah, this is the sixth commandment. Okay. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother, you good for nothing, will be brought before the council. And whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fires of hell. So if you're about to offer your gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go at once and make peace with your brother and then come back and offer your gift to God. If someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, settle the dispute with him while there's time before you get to court. Once you are there, he will hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to the police and you will be put in jail. There you will stay, I tell you, until you pay the last penny of your fine. That's pretty clear, right? Have we ever heard sermons on those two paragraphs? I don't think I have. You have? You haven't? Oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> well, now, if you, if you go back to the Old Testament, we don't have time to read all these verses. Exodus 20, verse 13, which is the thou shalt not kill. Exodus 21, 12, and Leviticus 24, 17, you'll see that there were actually death penalties connected with breaking this, this rule. Breaking what rule? Thou shalt not kill. If you, if you kill somebody, in fact, what's going to turn out that there are death penalties connected to the breaking of every single one of the commandments except one. Which one do you think doesn't have a death penalty connected to it? The last yeah, one. Number the tenth command. Why, why not? You make it up in your mind. You can't read their mind. Yeah. Other can't, people can't read your mind. They can't tell why you're doing it. You cannot be arrested for thinking. 
can't be arrested for thinking. But this is another point you were talking about. When those death penalties were there, they were put to a different kind of pe people than there are today. Um, these guys, I don't think you would recognize them. The way they live, mm -hmm. you know, the way they treat each other, the way they, they, you know, just get things done. So well, to give you a little feel, if I can get my computer to behave the way I want it to do here, to give you a little feel about how they thought about such things, look at Judges 1, starting with verse 18. I'm sorry, Joshua. I wanted to say Joshua here. Uh, judges. <laughs> Every is this we obeyed Moses. <laughs> yeah. And it still didn't go there. Sorry. Trying to get my computer to go and not wanting Both to go. Both you and your computer are having a senior moment, huh? I guess so. <laughs> huh. Well, it's Probably better than we could do. Because it might be thinking part of it's still there. Okay, let's... Then Joshua... Well, no, let's start with verse... 16. Let me start. 16. They answered Joshua, We will do everything you have told us, and we will go wherever you send us. Now, they were, this is Joshua taking charge after Moses is gone. We will obey you just as we always obeyed Moses. <laughs> Don't everybody laugh right here. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever questions your authority or disobeys any of your orders will be put to death. Be determined and confident. That's the mindset that they had. It was yeah. either black or white. It's just no, no shades of gray, no, no reasoning, just... How long did it take them before they disobeyed Joshua? Oh, almost no time at all. Okay. Was that just cultural to say, we will obey, we will obey? Partly, yeah. But, I mean, they're a bunch of slaves. What, what do slaves do? Oh. It wasn't that long before this, uh, making mud bricks with and without straw in it. That was there and for several hundred years, right? Four hundred years, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. No, they don't, the, the making of bricks and the being slaves probably only lasted about a hundred years. Yeah, I thought it was longer. Because the 400 years includes the time from Abraham all the way down until they got into the, the Exodus. So the time they were in Egypt was probably about 200 years. And then the first part of that was Joseph and all his doings and so forth. So the time they were actually in slavery was probably about 100 years is a long time to be in slaves. Mm -hmm. So the 10th commandment. And Paul recognized that in Romans 7. We don't have to read, time to read those verses right now. But he said, when I read that 10th commandment, it made me angry. Until I realized, what? What did he realize? You remember? Anybody remember? Realized. Why is the Tenth Commandment important? Well, it's the basis. It's well, really the basis, basis for all the rest of them. You, think, you have to think something wrong before you do something wrong. You can't do something without thinking about it. So Paul said, hey, you know what? If we could actually get to the place where we never had a bad thought, we would be safe to admit to heaven. Is that why premeditated murder mm -hmm. is more gets more penalty than just spontaneous oh, yes. murder? Exactly. In exactly. Old society. Ben's Ray. Yeah. Hmm? Now, how do you get to the point where you don't even think about sin? Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And is really, that something that we do? It's possible. It's possible? Well, yeah. Cro crowd out on. the evil. That's just, like, that's just like going up and saying you, you can make gold if you don't think about the red-faced monkey. I think it's, it's <laughs> worth it. I mean, how are you going to do gold without thinking no, about the no, red-faced no. monkey? Paul, Paul tells us, Philippians 4 eight. He says, just crowd your mind full of good things until there's no room for the bad. Just as simple as that. It's, 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 I tried that, but there was some things that kept coming in of the well, crowd you, you with the to, crowd. <laughs> you, you, need, you, need to keep, you need to keep filling your mind full of good things. I heard a brand new doctor at Advent Hope. He, he just became a doctor. He says, I'm finally a doctor after about, what, 10, 12 years of being. And he says, folks, train your thinking now. He said, once you get old, the filters start going, and whatever you've been thinking your whole life comes out your mouth. Mm -hmm. He says, so if you think people don't know what you're thinking, 
when you get older, they will know. So he said, train your thinking now. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Most, many of us have known about elderly people who seem like saints, who when they <laughs> get senile... Yeah. coming out. Yeah. Huh? Well, I, I wonder, though. I, I don't know. I think, I think um, faith is the hope that you will get to that point Sure. And I don't think I don't think there's nothing we can do to do that except God accomplishes it in you. Oh sure. But but, that's what God does the work. You problem. just give him the opportunity. You right. just say, God, I'm gonna fill my mind with things from the Bible, good deeds, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I wanna think about you, I want a better relationship with you. You fill your mind with that instead of other junk so, and so it, so it isn't going to happen unless you do that. We have it to keep, do it. Up yeah. Now isn't that isn't this another performance thing here that we got to no because the, no because you don't do any of it. You just give God the chance to do it. So it's not a matter said, of you. You got to you got to fill your mind with the right things. Well, you just said that. But okay, but what did, what was I meaning? I mean, you have to give God. God does the changing, but you okay. you you if you say God stay away from me, He's going to stay away from you. So you have to be the one. You're the only one who can open up your mind I and say. I have never told God to stay away from me, but I still have the things in my mind. Well, but you, are you? Are you? Are you? The question would be, how much time are you spending saying to God, "I'm reading my Bible, I'm studying this, I'm whatever these things to, to let God to let God's thoughts into your into well, your. Well, you're going to have to give me that checklist so I can yeah. start checking yeah, no. it there's off. Yeah, there's another uh, <laughs> thing you don't say to God. Um, help me with my mind and then you go off to a movie rated yeah. R movie and then help me with my mind and then you go into a bar and have a drink you say help me with my mind and you go take a walk out in nature mm -hmm. and really if you've met some of these farmers who are just farming each day and they don't have time for TV and they don't have time to really read the newspaper and learn the junk you know you talk to them and sometimes you just get this this uh, innocent kind of person that, and, and I think it's a real joy to find a person that's unpolluted mm -hmm. by our polluted world. So I think part of it is putting yourself in the right place also. You know, you know I, went, I went into the, um, went on a walk once with, with a bunch of people from church. Uh huh. And uh, it was a beautiful day. It was beautiful. Birds were out and they're singing and everything. But you know this really good looking girl walked by on the on the trail <laughs> and I would not really say that my thoughts were perfect. <laughs> That's why Matthew five Okay, we got <laughs> Matthew five is here. So now we gotta go to verse twenty seven. Well, all the farmers Well see I'm just wondering if you can even cry you no. can't even cro um, crowd all this stuff out. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm gonna give you a brief answer. <laughs> If those, and I'm talking Christians generally, not just Adventists, the really genuine Christian farmers, ranchers, I can almost guarantee they probably knew major parts of the Bible by heart. They might not have watched the TV. They probably listened to the stock prices once a day. A lot of those folks were raised on the good old book and they've never forgotten it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm reading Matthew 5, 27. Where's, where's the story about Gary here? <laughs> <laughs> You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. Gary, you still have both eyes? <laughs> it is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs for, than for your whole body to go to hell. Now that's pretty serious talk. Yeah, that's, isn't that the point? It is serious. I knew a, a fellow years ago, that well over 20 some years ago, he went to the Campus Crusade for Christ and they read that passage. So he went home and took his lawn edger and whacked off his arm. Oh my God. It's not a joke. What you have to realize, and what brought it to my mind, was uh, a recently an archaeology magazine, they had a picture. Mm -hmm. it, this was the custom when, when, say, somebody from Syria or Babylon came and took the Israelites, 
They chopped off hands. Mm -hmm. If you were lucky, you just lost ones. If you were, if, if you'd give the enemy a harder time, they took them both. They do that in, in Saudi Arabia for stealing right now. I know that. And I, back in this 20 was, this is quoted from back in Christ's time. So in that part of the world, you're right. They still do it. Now, so people don't go home and Which do something serious. to themselves. Uh, okay, what no. was Jesus yeah. saying when he said that? What, what did he okay, mean? Just well, say it was, it's important. Okay, uh, the next two points that are handout, we'll deal with oh, that. We'll deal with it, okay. Why do you think Jesus spoke so forcefully against those who committed adultery? Should people really be cutting out their own eyes or cutting off their own hands? No. Was Paul possibly thinking about this passage when he wrote Romans 7, 24? What does that say? What an unhappy man I am. This is Paul. Who will, who will rescue me from the, this body that is taking me to death? But then he says, Thanks be to God who does this to our Lord Jesus Christ. This then is my condition. On my own I could serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. However, and that was Paul. That was Paul, Romans 7. This is now, wild. huh? This is wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got, he wants to do this mm -hmm. while his body is yeah. serving, serving sin. So. Okay, now let's be honest. It is not a sin that men are attracted to women and vice versa. We should have learned that from the story of Adam and Eve. So it makes, what makes that attraction turn into a sin? If men and women were not attracted to each other, very few would get married and the race would die out. I mean, literally. Yeah, it, makes sense. it is interesting to notice that the Old Testament rules about divorce seem to focus primarily on the women. Look at that, for example. Hold on here just a second while my computer gets carried away here. Hmm. Suppose a man marries a woman, later decides that he doesn't want her because he finds something about her that he doesn't like. So he writes out divorce papers, gives them to her, and sends her away from his home. Then suppose she marries another man, and he also decides that he doesn't want her, so he also writes out her divorce papers, gives them to her, and sends her away from his home. Or suppose she's, her second husband dies. In either case, her first husband is not to marry her again. He is to consider her defiled. If he married her again, it would be offensive to the Lord. You are not to commit such a terrible sin in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Boy, that's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, is there a reason behind that? Well, that's, what, that's a good question. Because men made the, those rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, be careful. It's only part of the story because yeah. the men get there, come up, and it's a little later on. Yeah. And the women get protected. So there's two so sides. So Christ's explanation and expansion of the commandment against adultery focus specifically on men. Why this difference? Notice these interesting words from Ellen White. The surrender of the will is represented as plucking out the eye or cutting off the hand. Well, that's what, good what? to know. Surrendering of the will. Surrendering of the will is pictured, represented as plucking out the eye and cutting off the hand. Often it seems to us that to surrender the will to God is to consent to go through life maimed or crippled. And God doesn't want us that way. No. But it is better, says Christ, for self to be maimed wounded or crippled, if thus you may enter into life. That which you look upon as disaster is the, bo is the door to highest benefit. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, 61, paragraph 1. So, what's the real maiming here? Surrendering your will to God. Surrendering your eye to God, surrendering your hand to God. What are we saying there? When you say surrender the will to God, what are you really saying? Opening it up so he can work with you. Okay, well, very you good. talk about will, because that's what you want to do, isn't it? Let, let's, let's get right to the point. The question is, who's going to be in charge here? Uh, if I'm going to do what I want to do, or I'm going to do what God wants me to do? Hey, where did all this freedom go then? Well, the freedom, okay, would you... Let's just say, let's say you want to be really free. So you say, I can take a gun, I can point it in my forehead, and I can pull the trigger. I want to be free. Yeah, but I don't need the Lord to keep me from putting a gun in well, my hold head. Hold on, just wait, okay. just a bit. Wow. So how long are you going to be free? About as long as it takes for the bullet to go out to the end of the barrel, right? That's how long you're going to be free. It's the same way when you commit sin. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How can you be free by having a gun to your head? I'm saying... A person, could, is, 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 a person could say, and some people do say, 
You can't tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do. If I choose to pull, put a bullet in my head, I can do that. That's freedom. Some people would say that to you. Power of choice, in another word. Okay. Okay. That's, okay, that's freedom. Yeah. Well, you know how long it's going to last. As soon as the bullet enters your head, your freedom's gone. Well, it lasts your whole life then. Exactly. <laughs> but that's exactly what sin does to you. Sin is exactly the same as pointing a, a, bear, a gun to, the head, to your head and pulling the trigger. It is deadly. Sin pays its wage, not eternal life, death. So now you may not see the results quite as fast as you would with pulling the trigger of a gun, but it's the same thing. Now you said surrendering to God. I'm trying to understand this a little okay. better. Yeah, that's Because a, it sounds like you're surrendering yourself to a dictator. Well... I but, mean, you might but, as well, okay, right? The, 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 uh, well, yes, but the question is, what kind of dictator is it? Oh, come on. No, so we've got a good dictator and a bad dictator. So okay, a good dictator a, means that you're free. If you, call, <laughs> you can, if you want to call him a dictator... No, I'm I don't, not I, calling him a dictator. Yes, I'm, you are. I'm calling anybody that you, you, um, you surrender your will to okay. would be a dictator. If you surrender your will to God, you get self-control. Yeah, that's what that's what it says. It gives you back five. the dignity of self control. Yeah, isn't that kind of ironic? Yeah, it is ironic. It is intentionally. Ironic? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what? So what we're saying here is that if you knew someone who was infinite wisdom, and never gives you any rules or any laws that aren't for your own good, if you're really smart, you would do what he tells you to do. Okay. That's the kind of surrender we're talking about. Okay. So what you're really saying is when you do what you want to do, you're actually damaging yourself. When you do with what God wants you to do, you're actually benefiting yourself. And that's yeah, when you talked about God actually writing the law into your own heart, after that happens, don't you just do the right thing after that? You, well, that would be nice. Did well, I, no, no. I'm, look at the process. point I'm making. There's a whole process. You're making your I'm, God I'm, is going to write His law into your heart. Now He's giving you the tools right you're here. You're doing what you want to do. Now you're doing exactly what God does, but you you're doing it exactly the way you want to do it. But it's the same the, thing. There you go. Okay. It's the now, same thing. That's a reconciliation. But I'm not really surrendering to him anymore. I'm just doing the stuff. Because it made that sense. That's the ultimate, it's rational. It's the ultimate goal. I don't know if you can read this on my screen a little bit, but I think I'm going to let God answer this question for you. Okay. Here, this is Desire of Ages, 668, paragraph 3. All true obedience, that's what you're talking about, comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, there's the part I was talking about. If you, if you consent, you, God won't do it unless you consent. He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. Who, who's doing it? God. He's doing it. That when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience to an appreciation of the character of Christ. Really, what that really means is recognizing that everything that God asks us to do is really for our best good. Through communion with God, because that's how we learn what his will is for us, sin will become hateful to us. There's so much irony to all this. I have examples. Okay, we have the freedom to look at pornography. Okay, mm -hmm. God, I'm free to look at pornography. Okay, then you start looking and you get in trouble. Uh, you may lose your job because they found it on your uh, work computer, which happened to a teacher at our school. And you could end up in prison and that sort of thing. And your freedom... It's what seemed like freedom is closing your world in till you're actually maybe even in prison. So you say, God, I surrender my will to your way, to your way. God's way is to live uh, in a way that won't get you in trouble. And then when you become more like God, I mean, this is a God who created the universe, created all the creatures under the sea, the birds flying in the air. 
And all of a sudden, you're involved in activities that are creative and fun, and they don't get you in prison, they don't get you in trouble, mm -hmm. they don't get you in fired, and you actually have more fun than when you were uh, looking at a computer screen at pornography. Yeah. So, and that's the freedom that God offers you is a healthy freedom. Mm -hmm. And when you surrender your will to God's will. So who wouldn't want to surrender their will to God's will? And, and the question we're I very lucky. We're the, very, very, when, just we're very lucky that God even wants to bother with our wills. Yeah. He could say, away with you. I see, I see all that what you're talking about. The only question I have is when does the will of God get into your heart every day? Uh, it's a minute it has, by it has, minute, minute. I mean, when is this person going to not want to do pornography anymore? When does that happen? It will either, it, it like, time. like stop smoking, it will either happen instantly or over time with as, as a person exercises, when does the muscle develop? One day, all of a sudden, you got a muscle. You know, like this lady in water aerobics has been making us do push-ups on the side of the pool. And I looked in the mirror and I thought, I've got a muscle. When did that come? <laughs> you know, and I go on this little toothpick of an arm, all of a sudden goes, doop. And so when, when did it happen? I don't know. But sometime during the push-ups, that little muscle came there. So well, what happens if you do all your push-ups and no muscles show up? Oh, uh, that is a principle. That doesn't happen. If you do enough push-ups, you're going to get a muscle. Yeah. I don't know. There's, the work you know, the there's, work. I had an aunt that tried to, tried to diet all she could, and she couldn't lose weight for no reason. Well, well here's she another, was cheating. Here's another no, thing. Yeah, I don't know. What, what people self-report they do is often, if you look at their life, not what they do. Someone will say, all the time, I've got a cousin that's near 300 pounds. I don't eat anything. I, you know, I just, I, I okay, walk two miles so. a day. I, I do. And I'm going, oh, okay. You know. okay. So you're confident that it's going to happen. Absolutely. That, that person. We have God's had, word for it. It's, it's a matter of physics. Well, I know, I know God is going to do it, but my question is when? The rest, it, it, by the time you oh, get to the end of your life. You just got to well, keep just, doing those push-ups. work of a lifetime. The work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no, I got a when do you get to the point where you can go outside and you know that you don't have to worry about the the um, pornography anymore going back to it uh it, 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 when you turn your when the devil is gone <laughs> okay okay <laughs> look at the next section matthew 5. we'll have to think about that okay. you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but now i tell you do not take revenge on someone who wrongs you if anyone slaps you on the right cheek let him slap your cheek your left cheek out too and if someone takes you to court to sue you for your shirt let him have your coat as well and if one of the occupation troops forces you to carry his pack one kilometer, carry it two kilometers. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something, lend it to him. Does that sound like turning into a doormat? Somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a law that was found in many ancient societies. The, the Latins put a name to it. It's called the Lex Talionis, the law of the claw, okay? The law of retaliation. Um, There's a lot of uh, so-called Bible-believing Christians that think that's really the way the thing means, and that's why yeah. Jesus paid a penalty and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Well, wh what's really going on there? I can tell you that there was a time in ancient in, in Roman history where a slave got angry and killed the, his master, who happened to be a senator in the Roman Senate, and they killed 400 slaves in response. So Lex Talionis is not saying, you know, kill that person if he kills you or take out his eye if he knocks out your eye. It's, it's saying one eye for one eye and not 400 eyes for one eye. We have something similar in the law now, not to uh, use excessive force. You have yeah. to miss force with force. Yeah. yeah. So how are Christians supposed to retaliate? Remember Proverbs 25, 21, and 22? If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. You will make them burn with shame. And of course, the King James says, you will pour coals of fire on their head, right? And the Lord will reward you. That doesn't sound like a doormat to me. <laughs> well, I was asking a question. <laughs> some, some people cannot but do that. 
There's an interesting story in the Old Testament that you probably remember. Do you remember the story of uh, Elisha and Gehazi? No. Mm -hmm. Remember that they were in the city of Dothan? It was a walled city, a small city, but walled, and they were there, and the the king of Israel was in at war with the with the king of uh, I think this was Damascus at that time. Syria. If I'm not, Syria was it Syria? Well, Syria, I think. And of course, Damascus was the capital. And um, so the king was asking, okay, who's telling all these secrets? You know, because every time he tried to attack the Israelites, they would be there ready for him. He says, who's, who's, who's the spy in our group that's telling us? They, so some of us says, you know, there's no spy in our group. There's a prophet down in Israel, and God tells him what you say in your bedroom. So he says, well, I'm going to get that guy. And so he sends his army down. They surround, one night, they surround this small city of Dothan. And next morning, Elisha wakes up, and his servant wakes up and looks out, and here they, the place is completely surrounded by these other soldiers. And, the, and Gehazi, the servant, he is in a panic. And what did what is what does Elisha tell him to do? Do you remember? Open his eyes. Oh, he says, right, you got it there. Open open his the eyes, Sy Lord. When the Syrians Syrians attacked, Elisha prayed, O Lord, strike these men blind. Oh. The Lord answered his prayer and struck them blind. Then Elisha went to them and said, You're on the wrong road. Was that a lie? This is not the town you're looking for. Hmm? Follow me and I will lead you to the men you're after. And he led them to Samaria, which was the capital. As soon as they had entered the city, Elisha prayed, Open their eyes, Lord, and let them see. The Lord answered his prayer. He restored their sight and they saw that they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw the Syrians, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, sir? Shall I kill them? No, he answered, Not even soldiers you have captured in combat would you put to death. Give them something to eat and drink and let them return to their king. So the king of Israel provided a great feast for them, and after they had eaten and drunk, he sent them back to the king of Assyria. From then on, the Syrians stopped raiding the land of Israel. Isn't that the answer? <laughs> Probably one of the few times that happened. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that story before. Really? Yeah. What book is it in? It's, second, it's, in, it's, it's also in Second Chronicles. It's Second Kings 6 and Second Chronicles 25. As a child, did you ever wish that you could heap coals of fire on an offending sibling or a rival? But truthfully, is it really possible to heap coals of fire on someone's head by using kindness? Well, Elisha did, didn't he? Well, then what about the ultimate test now? Can you really love your enemies? Love is an action word. I think you can. Depends on what you do, the things you do. Yeah, you, I, don't, I don't know if, if actions are going to define what love is. I think so. Sometimes, sometimes love is discipline. Way back in Leviticus 19, verse 18, Moses said, God said through Moses, Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate them, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. Okay? How do you love a person that keeps attacking Attacking, yeah. attacking. Yeah. Good well, question. That was a pretty radical verse for that day, yeah. especially when they pretty had radical laws. verse for our day. Yeah, they, they well, especially for a time when they they had to kill people that did minor infractions, yeah. and then you got this that little verse well, there. Let, That's let's, pretty. Let's, let, let's just take a few examples from the Word of God, okay? How do you think God feels about His wicked children? He loves them sorrowful. Mm -hmm. If we love our enemies, are they still enemies? Probably won't be if you did enough. They are if they're going to continue to harm you. If you want to read some more about this lesson in some detail, go to Desire of Ages, page 298 to 314. I'm going to read you a couple of passages from those pages. Every impure thought defiles the soul, impairs the moral sense, and tends to obliterate the impressions of the Holy Spirit. It dims the spiritual vision so that men cannot behold God. The Lord may, may and does forgive the repenting sinner, but though forgiven, the soul is marred. All impurity of speech or of thought must be shunned by him who would have clear discernment of spiritual truth. Desire of Ages 302.2. That's pretty 
pretty strict, isn't it? Look at 306, paragraph 1. While those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, <clears throat> those who cling to sin, to sin war against the truth and its representatives. So you have a choice of fighting against your sinful nature, <coughs> excuse me, or fighting against wrong. Um, or fighting against truth. If I, I'm fighting against truth, I'm sorry. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people whom they despise and oppress. Theo 6, paragraph 4. Well, what would be the result if we truly followed God's recommendations after keeping, about keeping His law? Desire of Ages, 308, paragraph 1. The law is an expression of the thought of God. When received in Christ, it becomes our thought. It lifts us above the power of natural desires and tendencies, above temptations that lead to sin. God desires us to be happy, and He gave us the precepts of the law that in obeying them, we might have joy. What is so damaging about not trusting God and breaking His commandments? All who obey as He did are likewise declaring that the law is holy and just and good, Romans 7, 12. On the other hand, all who break God's commandments are sustaining Satan's claim that the law is unjust and cannot be obeyed. Thus they second the deceptions of the great adversary and cast dishonor upon God. They are the children of the wicked one, who was the first rebel against God's law. To admit them into heaven would again bring in the elements of discord and rebellion, and imperil the well-being of the universe. No man who willfully disregards one principle of the law shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Desire of Ages 308.4. That ought to help us all go home very subdued, right? <laughs> Well, what would Jesus say to the members of your church in the 21st century? How many of us would compare to the, how, how many of us would compare to the people in Jesus' day? And I'm going to read one more paragraph. We're about out of time. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. The darkest chapters of history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. Well, we don't have time to talk about. God's ideal, but his, his perfection, he is perfect in his fears. We may be perfect in our severe, and it's possible. This command is a promise. Read Desire of Ages 311, paragraph 2, and see how God means this command is a promise. See you next week.